All right, Noso Nation, welcome back to the countdown of the top 40 WrestleMania performers. We're here at number 28. We're going over the man who hopes to finish his story this year at WrestleMania 40, the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes, and he has a very interesting WrestleMania history, and I'm here with Steve. Steve, how we doing today? I'm doing good. Glad to be here. And yes, uh, I guess you could say we are uh, feeling the adrenaline in our souls as we talk uh, talk the the American nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cody Rhodes kind of had a, I don't want to say a rough start in WrestleMania. He debuted in the company in 2007, and it took him until 2010 in order to be on a WrestleMania main show card. Now, do you think things are easier nowadays to get on the WrestleMania card? Yeah, now that it's um, two nights, I definitely think it is. Um, although, if you think about it, even though it is two nights, it does feel like the cards are a little bit more compact than they have been when, where they were doing like the, you know, the five six hour marathons <laughs> there for a while. <laughs> um, I mean, you think about they now do the the Andre Battle Royal on SmackDown, so it seems like guys who don't get on the main card now are just kind of get on that. One. It's I think it was long overdue that they were gonna that they had to do the two nights. If there was a positive out of the pandemic, I should say it should be that Mania went to two nights. Mm-hmm. Yep. And let's go to Cody Rhodes' WrestleMania debut. It's the Legacy Implosion as Cody Rhodes faced off against Randy Orton and Ted DiBiase. Both, all, all three of these guys, tremendous second and third generation superstars, with the story being that Cody and Ted were just sick and tired of Randy's controlling attitude. And this was a very interesting story because as the story of Legacy was building, it was almost like it was set up for Ted or Cody to turn on Randy Orton, but Randy Orton was so popular at this time that he was the one who actually turned on them and benefited from the legacy breakup. Now, how did you like the structure of this match? Because it was kind of like a handicap match to start, but still triple threat rules. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much, like you said, worked like a handicap match the entirety of entirety of it. Um, I think there was like a brief moment where Cody and Ted went at it, but for the most part, they stuck together, um, but Orton was able to fight them off. Interesting spot in the card, second from the top, you know, second from the bottom, coming off the, you know, the tag title match. And, you know, I thought nine minutes, I thought was a good length for it. Didn't, you know, overstay its welcome. Um, one of the few matches that kind of delivered on its, you know, expectations on a on a card that I think a lot of people view as kind of disappointing overall. You know, Orton, like I said, takes them out pretty easily. Takes out, out Cody with the punt, and then he hits the RK on on Ted to win. Because you figure they had big things for Orton coming up down the line um, throughout 2010. And um, again, kind of non non inconsequential match here for uh, for all three guys. I just remember this match being the return of the Randy Orton pose because. Now that he's babyface again, he gets to do the Orton pose that everyone loves and cherishes and has fond memories of. But quite the WrestleMania debut for Cody Rhodes. I remember that he came out to his generic spaceship kind of theme that was uh, synonymous with his early days. And he goes through the rest of the year as dashing, and then he transitions to undashing Cody Rhodes against Russell against Rey Mysterio at WrestleMania 27. Now, this match is interesting because the backstory of it, Ray told Cody he wanted to work with him at WrestleMania and and gave Cody the task to write the entire storyline of this match. And it's kind of folklore whether or not Cody Rhodes actually broke his nose uh, during this build like they portrayed on television. And personally, this is one of my favorite matches on the WrestleMania card. I when I was uh, younger, I put this over the Triple H Undertaker match just because I kind of like these middle-of-the-card matches to uh, showcase more young, more uh, more younger stars with an established talent. What did you think about this whole storyline heading up to Cody Rhodes and Rey Mysterio, and how did you think Cody benefited from it? I think he benefited greatly. I mean, like you said, he went through all 2010 as the dashing gimmick, kind of getting over his, you know, the fact that he's, you know, a good-looking guy. An inadvertent 619, you know, you know, breaks Cody's nose supposedly, and then, like I said, he puts the mask on. He goes to the undashing, and he really, really got that gimmick over. Um, and the fact that they were able to get a, you know, big spot here in Mania was kind of show faith for for Cody. Um, I love Ray's um, Captain America outfit. You know, continuing his trend of doing the superhero outfits at Mania. And like you said, they had a really good match. Um, you know, again, kind of, I think this was second, third match going in and get a good amount of time, 12 minutes and uh, a shocking win. I don't think anyone expected Cody to win. I think they just expected Ray to, you know, win and finish the feud off. But Cody does, he uses the mask, but he does um, get 
kind of the big upset win, you know, which was a good good spot for him. Obviously, they would have a rematch the next month with uh, Ray getting the win back. But I think definitely a good uh, good showcase for both guys, and particularly a good showcase for Cody, who would go on to have a really good um, 2011 with most of it being the Intercontinental Champion. And let's go off to one of those Intercontinental Championship matches as we have Cody Rhodes versus the Big Show at WrestleMania 28. Now, if this was if the last example was uh, an established star putting over a younger talent, this was kind of the inverse of it. But the story actually made sense for why the veteran was going over because Big Show's WrestleMania record, let's just say he's not going to be on the top 40 list anytime soon just with that. <laughs> record in general and trying to get that one big moment out of WrestleMania and Cody Rhodes by proxy was kind of like bullying big show about his embarrassing WrestleMania moments. And then it translated into an intercontinental championship match with the big show uh, winning over Cody Rhodes. And apparently what Cody claims is after this match, his father told him that maybe he should leave WWE and go out on his own just based on his portrayal of this feud and this match. What did you think about this feud? And do you think this kind of stalled Cody's singles momentum at the time? It was fine, a fine enough match. Um, again, kind of on a, on a loaded card with, um, you know, two big top matches still to come. Again, the story going in was pretty good with, you know, Cody ragging on show for his uh, lack of WrestleMania moments, even though show's been in a bunch of, you know, big moments, he's kind of been on the losing end of all of, all of them. So going in, you figured, you know, show was going to win. And plus it's, it's kind of weird the way the, the feud was set up. Cause like a guy like big show, how do you expect to, you know, kind of feel sorry for him when he's, you know, trying to sell to, you know, something that's, you know, like Cody, that's kind of a, you know, little interesting kind of way they went about it. But again, a good, you know, good win for show. He gets kind of one of the last few belts that he hadn't won to that point um, in the intercontinental title. And like you said, yeah, it did kind of stall Cody because by the time we get to, the end of the year, he's fully entrenched in the Road Scholars team with Damian Sandow. So I think he had definitely kind of lost a little bit of momentum that he had gotten from the previous year. And it would, would take a little bit for him to kind of rebound. Especially with Team Road Scholars. They were actually supposed to be in a match at WrestleMania 29 with the Bellas against Tons of Funk and the Funkadactyls. But that match got cut for time, so they had it on the next night on Raw. So we're not going to cover it because it didn't make the show, unfortunately. So we have to fast forward into the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, the first ever one of its kind at the time. And I wouldn't say it's disappointing that everybody's in the Battle Royal because the first one, they really did hype it up as a huge accomplishment to achieve. And we're coming off the Rhodes Brothers dethroning the Shield for the tag titles. And now at WrestleMania, they really didn't really have a solid program going in. So they were thrown into the Battle Royal. What were your thoughts on the concept of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal? And do you think WWE has properly capitalized on the victory as much as they should? Have? Well, going in, it was definitely a um, a good I, a good idea. You know, the 30th Mania, do something really special. You know, you had Hogan hyping it up, you know, really big. And, um, and the 30 guys they had in it, it was a pretty kind of you know stacked fields of guys who had you know were not involved in any big matches at that mania so they you know put them in this match cody kind of felt like a um inconsequential part of the match you know when you look at some of the guys in there that got a lot more shine like you know sheamus del rio big show cesaro um, kofi dolph they were kind of like the highlight guys of the match and cody just kind of felt like an outside kind of an outlier in the match i think he gets kind of far in the match but he doesn't make it to like the final eight i think is where he gets eliminated finally gets eliminated and yeah i mean it was such a huge moment for cesaro to win and uh and we kind of this kind of starts here with Cesaro, and as we would see, we kind of we would kind of see throughout 2014, um, Cody would take a very much different turn. And if I were to say to anybody when this battle royal was first initiated that Jay Uso would be the most successful Andre the Giant battle royal winner, people would call me a little cuckoo bananas. But that's <laughs> neither here nor there. We're going to WrestleMania 31 in the Intercontinental Championship ladder match, and. Cody Rhodes isn't in this, but Stardust is. And this was Stardust's WrestleMania debut with the concept of this ladder match and the build for this Intercontinental Championship match was week to week. Everyone was stealing Wade Barrett's Intercontinental Championship. So one week somebody would have it, Ambrose would have it, and then Truth would have it, and then Stardust would have it, et cetera, et cetera. Basically a game of hot potato with actually, without actually winning the championship. Now, as far as builds go, it was silly, but... 
it's to get everybody in the card and it was a de facto way of having a multi-man ladder match now that the money in the bank had its own paper do you think uh stardust in particular showed out in this match and do you think ladder matches or multi-man matches at wrestlemania are kind of i don't want to say a lazy way to get everybody on the card but there needs to be a little bit more creativity other than this hot potato storyline. Yeah, you do have a good point. Um, it does. It can seem a little bit lazy booking, but usually the end result we get is you know really great stuff. And this was a great example of that because I think this is a fantastic ladder match. You've got, again, a lot of star power in here between Ambrose, uh, Daniel Bryan, Dolph Ziggler, Barrett, who is the champion, like you said, um, Stardust, Luke Harper, and um, our truth and they do they go you know balls to the wall for this you know this my i thought it was a great way to start the show as the opener stardust had some really good moments in here got some good shine i thought everyone had some really good shine um ambrose takes that nasty bump through the bridge ladder um via powerbomb from by uh, harper a big moment for uh for daniel bryan i mean a year ago he was winning the uh world title at 30 and now he comes here and he wins the ic title and this was during the time when everyone everyone was expecting the ic and us titles to kind of be elevated up to a you know more prominent role because that same night of course john cena won the us title from rusev and everyone thought like i said like that those two guys were going to carry those belts and make them really important again and of course sadly bryan you know got hurt again and it would eventually lead to his um brief retirement and we would see, obviously, would see what Cena would do with the U.S. title. But again, kind of a, you know, again, a great way to open the open the show. And, and Stardust did have some good shine in it. But as we'd see his uh, year from now to the next year, again, very uh, kind of inconsequential. And he really, again, kind of was starting to lose a lot of momentum. Well, you know what they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we have a yet another intercontinental ladder match. Uh, for the Intercontinental Championship. And of course, Stardust is in this. He has the Hard Times polka dot attire in tribute to Dusty Rhodes and his father. And it continues the uh, an odd storyline in both matches that Stardust has his own personalized ladder called the Starburst Mark II for this <laughs> match, which I have to say, I, I know a lot of people don't like the Stardust gimmick. I do. I thought it was a lot of fun. Did I want Cody Rhodes to be in that specific role? No, but he killed it nonetheless. And this would be his final WrestleMania. Now, as a final WrestleMania in this character, do you think this was the best way to uh, go out? I mean, it was as good as a way to go out as any. Um, like you said, he had the the polka dotted outfit, paying tribute to Dusty, who had um, who passed away the previous summer. Um, and again, another kind of, I mean, this ladder match wasn't as loaded as the previous year, but still some good names in it. You had Stardust, Dolph was back in it again, but then you had K KO, Sammy, Miz, Sin Cara, and uh, Zack Ryder. And again, open the show, which was a good move. Uh, probably you could argue the best match of that show. <laughs> mm -hmm. And again, I mean, all all seven guys got some good shine. Um, like you said, Stardust pulling out the polka dot ladder was a cool little was a cool little spot. Um, he ends up taking the the bump through the bridge ladder. Um, I think Sin Cara like comes off one of the ladders with a splash onto him. But really, other than that, he Stardust kind of again felt like you know probably the seventh man in that match. You know, a lot of the focus was on KO and Sammy. Um, and then, of course, a huge moment for Zach. He gets you know, the upset win when everyone never expected them to do so um, when he when he takes it, basically takes it from Miz. But I think by this point, you could tell that um, that Cody was kind of getting that feeling of, I think it's time for me to get out of here. And he did. He left. He went to some other place. I think people have heard of it before. But when he comes back to WrestleMania, his re-debut as the American Nightmare is at WrestleMania 38 as the surprise mystery opponent for Seth Rollins. And Seth Rollins was in a very unique position of trying to build a storyline without the guy on television to work off of or build off of. And in terms of re-debuting to a company, is this the right way to make a superstar right out of the gate as they did with Cody Rhodes re-debuting at WrestleMania 38 in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the rumors going in that it was going to be him. I mean, it was pretty obvious it was going to be, but there was still just that little bit of doubt that it was going to be somebody else. Like you said, he had you know reinvented himself on the indie scene um, as the American Nightmare. You know, made the name for himself that he he had always wanted to be, um, and eventually he does you know come back here. Massive pop from the crowd when he does eventually come out, and quite great symmetry. You know, he redebuts. In the same arena where he had his last mania 
um, at Stardust. And then he and Seth go on, and of course, go on to have a um, fantastic match. Lots of back and forth. Cody does end up getting the win. Um, no big shock there. And of course, that would lead to them having their great series. Um, they had a really good rematch at Backlash. And then, of course, uh, Hell in a Cell, where Cody's basically wrestling that whole match with one arm, and they go on to have a five-star classic. So great re-debut for Cody. Gets him right back into the into the scene. And, and you just know from here on, he's going to be one of the top guys for the company that he should have been from the start. I absolutely agree. And why not reward that top guy status with a WWE Undisputed Universal Championship match against the guy himself, Roman Reigns, at WrestleMania 39, where they went Hollywood. And this was Cody Rhodes's first WrestleMania main event. And in my opinion, out of all the 30s, this is probably maybe top three, maybe even top two main events of the WrestleManias of the 30s. And I know the ending gets a lot of flack. Like, it was very deflating, but I think that just kind of adds to the moment, depending on what they do at WrestleMania 40. And, again, if uh, the matches that are happening are happening, again, we're recording this before the confirmation on SmackDown with the, the tag team match and Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns 2, I think 28 is going to increase. Uh, Cody Rhodes' 28 isn't going to be 28 for long. We're going to see an increased value of that number. But as a main event for... WrestleManias in general, where do you rank Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns? That's tough. I mean, there's been some really great main events throughout the years. Um, I probably, yeah, I had to, I really have to think about that because, like I said, there's been a lot of great main events. I mean, me personally, my my number one is always going to be Rock Austin from 17 as a main event. I mean, obviously, you have you know the older ones. I mean, Hogan Andre, Hogan Warrior, all timers. Um, I would probably say right now, if I had to put it somewhere, I would have it probably at least top 10, just outside the top five. I mean, it was a fan. I mean, it was a excellent match. I mean, they just, you know, the story they told throughout it. And again, like you said, the, sh the absolute shocking ending. I mean, I was like probably the majority of the crowd that thought Cody was going to win this thing um, and was left absolutely stunned when Roman won. And I remember, like you said, there was a lot of backlash behind that, thinking that killed Cody's momentum. You know, looking back, obviously, I understand. I didn't understand because they, you know, by that point Roman was closing in on a thousand days as champion, so they wanted him just to get get to that milestone. And um, as we saw throughout the year, Cody would definitely keep his momentum going um, between the feud with Brock and then everything he did at the end of the year. You know, going with the War Games and then winning again the Royal Rumble over Punk. And like you said, now we got this, you know, this storyline: him and Seth against Roman and Rock. And I think if at the end of the day. If WrestleMania 40 night two closes with Cody holding up that belt in Philadelphia, it's definitely going to be all worth it at the end. And they would have had, they would now have just made their new guy. All right. And of course, with the new guy, you got to have some classics under your belt. And as I'm seeing right here, Cody Rhodes has a lot of classics at WrestleMania, really uh, hampered by uh, the first couple of matches. Now we have the rankings of, Rollins match at number one, Roman at number two, the IC ladder match at WrestleMania 32 at number three, and the one at 31 at number four. Do you agree with these rankings at the most part, or do you think there should be another match in consideration to break in that top four spot, in your opinion? No, I think that's a good top four. Actually, having just um, rewatched all the Manias recently, I think I would have 38 and 39 flipped. I would have 39 number one, and then 38 number two. And then I'd probably keep 32 and 31, three and four. I think those are good. Those are good choices. I, I agree too, uh, just because I think the Roman Reigns match is like how you do a modern day WrestleMania main event match. And I really do think uh, you mentioned the WrestleMania 17 match with Austin and Rock. And I do think that this match draws a lot of parallels to that match, just in terms of vibe, star power. And hypothetically, if the match were to go to bloodline rules and having a very similar stipulation as that one, I think they could even have a potential to top it at WrestleMania 40. But that's WrestleMania 40. We're just ranking Cody Rhodes based on his WrestleMania resume thus far. And overall, as a grade, what would you give Cody Rhodes' WrestleMania experience so far if you were to hand out a letter grade to it? I think right now I would probably say um, maybe a, a B, B minus. I think it's definitely heavily weighted by those last four matches. I think as well, I mean, honestly, 
if he never comes back to the company and doesn't have 38 and 39 under his belt, if he has just those um, those six, 26 to 32. So I think having the comeback and having those two great matches definitely helps his case. Like I said, maybe in a couple of years, maybe five years, if we review this list, if he continues to have the classics that he's having now, maybe he does move up the list. Um, but I think right now, as it stands, 28 is definitely a um, is definitely a good spot for him, just to make barely make it in the top 30. Yeah, especially being a one-time main eventer. Not going to be a last-time main eventer, though. Uh, I do see some increase in his position in future lists. But Steve, thank you so much for joining me at this no-so countdown. Number 28, Cody Rhodes going over his WrestleMania resume. Now, is there anything you want to plug, Steve, before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly plug um, over on the PTV Wrestling feed. I have Extreme Resurrection. That's me and James Gruberg. We're going through uh, WWE's version of ECW from 2007 to 2010. Uh, our most recent episode, we discussed the two episodes of ECW coming out of, Summer, of SummerSlam 2007. Um, so we are, of course, that was right around when the uh, signature pharmacy scandal was happening. So uh, one of the casualties, as I mentioned, was John Morrison. So on one of the episodes we watched, he ends up losing the ECW title to CM Punk um finally you know Punk finally gets that um gets the win he's he, that he's needed to become the champion uh, so we'll see how he kind of goes through the rest of 2007 as the as finally now as the top guy of the brand and I just want to plug something real quick uh I'm at retold Richie Mars on the TikTok and the Instagram new videos every day on current day wrestling some old school trivia everything like that under the sun I also have a podcast available on Spotify Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts called Wrestling Retold and Relive with Richie Mars no so's own ryan join me for an episode actually coming out today where we go through wrestlemania 32 all the way to 35 and if they were to make them night one and two wrestlemania specifically so we go down all the cards like that i also have a recent episode about sting's retrospective everything he's done in his career the unsung divas of the divas era era as well and some more retrospective episodes but this is the No So Countdown number 28, Cody Rhodes. Please enjoy the rest of the countdown. TTFN, ta ta for now, and we'll see you next time. Wrestling Roman, what's going on, buddy? Oh, not much. Come here, talk some wrestling with you about Sami Zayn. I'm excited about it. WrestleMania, Road to WrestleMania is happening. So obviously, I love talking wrestling. It's my last name, pretty much. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, before we put over Sami Zayn, let's put over Roman Wrestling. Roman Wrestling, you are you have a pretty popular TikTok that is, in my humble opinion, would say one of the better ones out there. And uh, thank you for joining Oso and taking your time to come talk to Sami Zayn. Well, I mean, I appreciate you saying that. Some days um, it is overwhelming sometimes about uh, some days my notifications are going nuts and people like me. And then the next week they're pretty dry. But overall, uh, I just have fun doing it. I never started yeah. making content just to be like, OK. How many likes can I get or followers? Yeah. I just started doing it because I seen everybody else talking about wrestling. And I was like, I want to talk about it, too. And so, so I guess uh, a few people kind of resonated with what I was saying. And uh, it's been a long road over a year, but uh, we just hit 10K not long ago and hopefully keep growing on TikTok. Yeah, I think your warm, welcoming, energetic personality does goes a long way with you. So uh, keep it up. You're, uh, yeah. you're rocking and rolling, my man. Yeah, I appreciate that. So. Sami Zayn, right? When you think WrestleMania yeah. and Sami Zayn, what comes to your mind? I think of kind of what he's been like most of his career, you know, that ultimate underdog. Um, every time, he's never really been the favorite in any of his matches. I mean, I guess you might have thought he was the favorite when he faced off against Johnny Knoxville. But honestly, <laughs> that's one of the first things, except for last year. Um, last year, because it's I guess it's so recent, um, yeah. with everything with him and the bloodline, him and Kevin Owens reuniting and all that. So that's kind of the first thing. But that match with him and Johnny Knoxville is kind of, it's just like burned into my brain because of how crazy and silly it was. But it was also pretty good. Like I was entertained. I, I thought it was a great time. I was absolutely sports entertained in that match for cool. sure. I think that they kind of go together, WrestleMania 38 and 39, that is. As he's kind of like a joke afterwards. Yeah. The company and the you know and the fans, the Arden fans really see that like wow, he mm -hmm. crushed that. You know, he yeah, took a silly yeah. situation and he absolutely crushed that. And then Roman Reigns coming off, I got two belts now, I'm the head of the table, yada yada yada, wanting to work with him and play around with him. And you know, so let's see what we can mm -hmm. do with this. And then a whole year later, 
We're at WrestleMania 39, and he's in the main event of night one against Roman's cousins, and he was in the bloodline, the falling out, yada, yada, yada. So it's like I look at those two WrestleManias, yeah. and I think they kind of go together. It's interesting as far as the one of them is at one end of the spectrum and the other one's at the complete opposite end because a lot of fans, while he, you know, Sami Zayn's always been a fan favorite, but going into 38, people were kind of seeing him as a joke. And yeah. I mean, that match at the end of the day, it does kind of make him look like a bit of a joke. But over the year, progressing into the bloodline, and then mm -hmm. it just shows you that sometimes you just kind of let him, got to let him cook, you know, you got to let him kind of see the plan through. And I, I don't think that the whole him joining the bloodline thing was this big master plan that they had, but so. somebody, somebody suggested it and it caught fire. The fans loved it. I loved it. Yes. Um, I bought like every shirt that he came out with. I got the honorary Oof shirt somewhere. I got the yeah. Phil and Usi shirt on right now. Uh, so yeah, I, it's a stark contrast between 38 and 39, but to say at the same time, I enjoyed both of them just as much. But he started at WrestleMania 32. Uh, he had just debuted returning at the Royal Rumble. So he's about two, three months into his WWE run, coming off that shoulder placement mm -hmm. displacement he had six or so months ago or whatever. And he's back and he's feuding with Kevin Owens. We'll kind of see that as a continuous here as yeah. we continue through his career at WrestleMania. But he finds himself in this WrestleMania 32 ladder match. Perhaps maybe one of the favorites coming in. Zack Ryder would go on to win it. But Sammy, for an opening, his WrestleMania career in this ladder match. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think this is a perfect spot for him. And it's well regarded. Dave Meltzer, four and a quarter. Canton, four stars. And JT from the no-so, four and a quarter for a 4.17 average. And Sammy Zayn has a lot to do with that. He's very active. He bumps really well. And he's this is just perfect for him at this time of his career. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that four and a quarter kind of that four range is pretty perfectly rated for it because, I mean, it's one of the Intercontinental Championship ladder matches that you think about at Mania. Yeah. And, of course, Sami Zayn was kind of one of those people you thought was going to win. And they really did swerve us with the Zack Ryder. Mm -hmm. um, trust me, I was woo-woo-wooing it way back Absolutely. then as well. I'm a big Zack Ryder fan. But, um, yeah, he did. He took some good bumps and obviously a great wrestler. Everybody was behind him. He just come back. And so was it a little disappointing at the time for a lot of his fans that he didn't win? Yeah, but I, I think that I'm happy that Zack Ryder got that feel good moment. But yeah, Sami Zayn, he did. He definitely showed out and showed that he could be a marquee guy in the future. It's a great introduction for him. And he would happen to take off WrestleMania 33. I believe he was in the Andre at no fault of his own, but he was kind of feuding with Braun Strowman at the time. And Braun Strowman ended up in the Andre. So, so did Sami Zayn. Uh, but at WrestleMania 34, he was in a pivotal role, really. Him and KO had just kind of come together at the end of 2017. And they were in a feud versus Shane McMahon in the SmackDown management. And the SmackDown management included Daniel Bryan. And he was cleared to return. And they had this big, pretty impactful angle but overall, me, I think the bar was super high with Daniel Bryan returning after being gone for three or four years in ring. And they kind of had a miss this night at WrestleMania 34 where him and Kevin Owens took on uh, Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that kind of shows you right there, though, like how they felt about Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens to put them against Daniel Bryan returning after a couple years off. And there was those moments in that match, you know, fans kind of holding their breath when Bryan yeah. would take a bump here and there. Uh, but yeah, I, I went back and watched that match and it's not as really necessarily a dig at the match itself, but I mean, no. uh, not a whole lot of it stood out to me. It was kind of fairly routine. Um, you know, obviously Daniel Bryan, Shane McMahon got the W on that one, uh, which luckily for Sammy, he was able to get his revenge a year or two later. Yeah, for sure. I just felt that the, the structure of the match should have worked too, with them kind of being sneakily getting them off, catching them off guard, starting them, jumping them up front, and then having Daniel and Shane kind of fight underneath and chase them. But it just felt like it didn't click. I don't know if Sammy and KO were kind of too long in the tooth as like these prickly heels at the time, but it just felt like it was a miss at WrestleMania 34. And that same sentiment kind of drags to WrestleMania 36. Daniel Bryan again, but this time for the Intercontinental Championship in a singles match. Perhaps the empty arena and not really catching the flow of the empty arena as it was kind of new here a few weeks or in from the pandemic being a thing. And they didn't really have a cadence down to how to structure a match or whatnot. But I felt that they kind of worked with the 
moving parts too much here. Cesaro and Nakamura would accompany Sami Zayn, and I believe Drew Gulak accompanied Daniel Bryan. I think they kind of leaned too much into the chasing and the cat and the mouse of it. And if they kind of went out there and had a hard hit and match like they would go on to have later in the pandemic with a style wise, when you can uh, really kind of get into guys and show the impact and stuff. Like I did Sheamus earlier on, and Sheamus style really shined in the uh, Thunderdome era or the empty arena era where you could go out there and be violent and that would kind of illuminate more on TV. Sami Zayn at this time with his character, like a scary little cat running away, yeah. just didn't really help the structure of this match. Oh yeah. That's um like I had said before about, uh you know, he, he got his revenge. He ends up winning, you know, yeah. over Daniel Bryan, but it was, you know, that scaredy cat cowardly heel way where like, he didn't feel like he really won. Like he technically won. But like he kind of just like snuck away with the W, you know. Um, that's one of those matches that um, around that time I wasn't really watching, like so I didn't watch that live or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and so I had come back, you know, a few years later. But um, so I went back and kind of watched it, and I ended up like it was. I didn't really pay attention to it that much. It was kind of not that memorable. I was just like, wow, you know, Sami Zayn, Daniel Bryan, like why am I not into this? And I, I mean, a part of it is that empty crowd, and yeah. they were really getting used to how they should be doing these matches and some people really translate well to it and some people don't. And I think in that case, uh, those guys just didn't really translate well to the pandemic era. Yeah. And that's crazy because these are, you know, two all time workers and you think they would learn how to adapt, but I just think the characters that they had going on at that time just didn't kind of play into the uh, scenario that they were in, but is what it is at the end of the pandemic or the foreseeable end of the pandemic here, he would find himself again, with Kevin Owens, but this time against each other. I believe this was the introduction to Logan Paul too on WWE TV, where they kind of just stuck him in here for a little star power. Uh, KO is your baby face, of course, and Sammy was your heel. Sammy kind of coming to the end of his heel run. Well, eh, kind of the median, but really yeah. he's still his chicken shit heel run here. And he finds himself in the crossroads of Kevin Owens. But what I think kind of hurt this match is, of course, they have a, a CVS receipt list of matches and feuds going on here. But I just felt that at this time in the feud, both of these guys had nothing going on. And the fans sensed that and they threw them together for a WrestleMania match instead of having real substance to sink their teeth into. Yeah, I, I think they kind of leaned on the whole, hey, Sammy, Sammy Zayn, Kevin Owens, they got history. You can throw them together whenever you want to. And yep. it, it, had, it had little bits and moments here and there. Uh, because they just have a natural chemistry, but at the same time, it doesn't really matter who you throw together, how great they are. Sometimes fans just aren't really going to resonate with it unless you give them a reason to. So you, mm -hmm. a lot of times, that, that, that unfortunate that does happen. But I mean, I went back and watched it, and overall, I thought it was a pretty good match. Uh, it's oh, yeah. I see that y'all have it rated at three point five stars. Meltzer and Canton have three point seven five. So I mean, that mm -hmm. that's kind of round where that's I would very probably. Good. It is that mid that mid to high somewhere three and a half to four somewhere in that range i think that falls right in there yeah for sure i think four four is all time for us you know on this scale and i just, just didn't think it hit that bar i'm probably closer to three and a half where that's a very good match but they were kind of yeah. missing the substance to kind of sink their teeth into because obviously these guys are very capable workers of as you can see here but either way the last three matches we talked about being disappointing of None of it's bad at all. So yeah, Sammy yeah. Zayn, yeah. resume-wise, has been fairly strong up to this point. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, I mean, it's not to say that they're bad matches or not. You yeah. know, it, they obviously the work is there, the technique and everything's there. Sometimes it just lacks just a hair of substance. It's a little more substance, and the match means so much more. It's kind of why we're talking about them in the 27s opposed to the 17s, 18s, you know, in the in the teens, so to speak, with with five or six matches here, but we gushed about the jackass match. Here's our chance yeah. to kind of gush about it again as a whole. Uh, I thought this was electric. I absolutely think Sami Zayn hit a home run here. However, my only kind of cue is to be a little nitpicky. Uh, they didn't land the finish, but I thought that when it didn't go their way, I thought Sammy was stellar in making it work. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, all the spots and everything in that match, the whole ja the whole jackass crew kind of coming out, getting involved. Uh, a lot of uh, all the crazy stuff. You had the mouse trap. You had the little, like you said about the miscues. You know, you had the the leg was supposed to, you know, come up, hit him between the legs, and somehow 
he was supposed to activate it by a remote and it didn't work. And luckily for Knoxville, he just said he just grabbed it and made it work, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but it was a fun match. It was goofy and silly and kind of corny. But I in mean, the best way, though. It, but yeah, but in the best way. And it, it kind of just reminds you why you want to be sports entertained sometimes. I love pro wrestling. I love wrestling, but I want to be sports entertained too. Like I want a little bit of everything. And so that was one of those matches where, yeah, technically sound. Was it a Daniel Bryan match, you know, type of thing? No. But was it just a good fun match? Did I laugh? Did did I have a good time? Hell yes, I did. Yes, it's, it's the culmination of that. Absolutely. The way you put it is, did I have a good time? Hell yes. I was fortunate enough to be live at this event and oh, the crowd awesome. was the crowd was engaged in, in awe the whole 14 minute. You know, they mm. had them in the palm of their hands. I thought it was excellent. It was it's but just from a like nerdy technical yeah. star rating standpoint. Oh, yeah. It's just that it's just like how do you this is really hard to rate, but I think it's great and I think four yeah. stars is definitely warranted. I mean, I can see why Meltzer was like, yeah, I'm not even rating this. I, I yeah. get it. I get it. But I mean, just off of if you just don't take yourself so seriously, exactly. this was a great match. This is a match yeah. that a lot of people are going to remember. I mean, we're still talking. I mean, it's, you know, two years ago. We're still talking about it. But if five, ten years from now, somebody mentions Sami Zayn at WrestleMania um, right now, they're going to say, what about that Kevin Owens and him versus the Usos? And what about when he faced Johnny Knoxville? That's going to be two of the three things that people are going to instantly talk about, Sami Zayn and WrestleMania. For sure. And the latter. Night one main event last yeah. year, WrestleMania 39. We already talked about the history leading into here. What an unbelievable moment. Five stars from Meltzer, five stars from Canton, four and three quarters from Justin for a 4.92 average. Sami Zayn's best WrestleMania match. It's close to it's four and three quarters for myself. Also, very close to five. Uh, I felt that they were a little bit, if you're gonna again, nerdy nitpick, like who the hell are we to? But I thought at the end, maybe a little bit too drawn out, but overall, fantastic match. You're not gonna see many better than that. Top 20 WrestleMania match yes. of all time, in my opinion, for sure. Perhaps top 15. Um, and I don't know if it's to that final tier, but overall, excellent. Oh, yeah, I definitely say it, it's up there all time, and it's just as far as recent, it's. About five, six, seven, at least just recent memory. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, you. I hate to use the term. A lot of people say it, you know, uh, but like this is cinema or whatever. Like that was literally like watching the climax of a trilogy that you've been watching, waiting on it to end. And you got the result that you wanted um, that the roof blew off the place, you know, when they won. And so, yeah, I was I was very into every single second of that match. And I, I kind of agree it did. Towards the end, it kind of drug on. But with the story, the emotion, everything that was invested in it, you kind of you can understand why they kind of drew it out. And then you had that finish. For sure. I, I loved it. If, it. if you give it five stars, in my opinion, you are not wrong whatsoever. Yeah. All right. So Sami Zayn, let's kind of just take a deep breath and look at his stats before we kind of get into where he's at. So out of his six total matches, he has a 3.75 star rating. That's pretty impressive. He has one main event. He has zero world title matches. He has three all-time matches. Again, that's four or above from one of us rating it. And then his WrestleMania's extras, 33 Battle Royal for the Andre. And then last year in the night two main event, he had a pretty important run-in. So with all that kind of being said, we went through his resume. We went through his extras. What do you feel about him at 27? You feel like it's the right spot? Did I? Did we discount the all-time match? Should we put him higher? Is there not enough meat on this bone? Should he be lower? What's your overall thought at Sami Zayn at 27? Oh, yeah. Uh, with his resume and everything, I think it's pretty strong. And you see with his uh, star rating average really high. Um, he's yeah. overall has had some pretty good matches. Uh, his win percentage is not so great as far as, you know, he, he has a yeah. losing record. But that can that can change over time. I mean, I'm pretty sure Shawn Michaels has a losing record at WrestleMania. So there's a lot of all time greats who don't have winning records at WrestleMania. And that's that's perfectly fine. But I think around that 27, if I really got a deep dive into everybody in there and I was real meticulous about it, he may be closer to 29, maybe maybe like a step or two lower. But I mean, 27, nothing wrong with that there. I mean, I'm sure you can get 
40 other people to talk about this and they would somebody might put him at 40 and somebody might say he's number 10. You just don't know what people are going to say. But as far as me, I think he's right. That's about right. 27 sounds about right. I agree with the consensus here, so to speak. Uh, you can it's we, like really we're in one of those weird swing spots. It's like how important he is yeah. to WrestleMania. But if you sink your teeth into it, he's pretty important. Uh, how are his overall matches? They're overall pretty good. And then the all time moments and the all time matches. They're kind of there. So perhaps if, if these people wanted to make them a little higher, I could see it. It's just really the one main event and no really overall yeah. world titles. Perhaps maybe hurt them a little bit, but overall, very strong and it's only growing. If we, you know, if we were to do this in five years, hopefully he's in the teens, early teens, maybe even the yeah. top 10, so to speak. We'll see how his career winds up. All right, Roman, as we head out of here, how can we find you, buddy? Well, I made it pretty easy for all y'all. It's at wrestling with Roman everywhere except for uh, X. X is Roman Wrestling underscore, but TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram is at wrestling with Roman. And also, uh, I, I'm just joined the Next Level app, which y'all can definitely check that out. There's a link in my bio on everywhere TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and X. You can click on that. It's Roman Wrestling there. It's a great way for you to talk to people about wrestling and not worry about all the other people who don't want anything to do with wrestling. So you can really create your own niche little community there. It's really interesting. So go check that out if you haven't, but yeah, wrestling with Roman pretty much everywhere. Uh, biggest on Utah, uh, big, <laughs> I, I'm bigger on TikTok right now than everywhere else, but everywhere else is slowly growing. Yeah. It's, it's weird how that kind of pans out and yeah. all, hopefully all, all, uh, all ships raise water or whatever, however that phrase goes with all of it. But uh, yeah, I've tried to use that phrase before and I, I messed it up too. So <laughs> Roman, we will see you on the next one, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me. We have to go old school Hardys, Mike Eller. How are you, buddy? I am doing great. How are you doing? Dude? I'm glad we could jam out to start. I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, How are you? Sure. One of the greatest themes ever. And I feel like the Hardys get overlooked on the list of like um, great theme songs. Like you always hear Triple H, you know, gets mentioned, Sean. But like the Hardys had that one, which is the original. Jeff, um, his solo one, like when he was world champion and, and when his comeback was awesome. And the Matt Hardy V1 song was great too. So they've yeah. had some real bangers. I totally agree. All right. So we are here as part of the No So Countdown Greatest WrestleMania Performers Ever Series. I want to thank Ryan Gray for putting this together. Uh, we have a lot of WrestleMania content going on right now in the Cell Connection. Myself and Ryan are also counting down every WrestleMania match ever. Uh, those are all in short format. So one match, one video, all under a minute. We've done all four, almost through all 100, uh, 402 of them at this point, Mikey. We're, uh, we're inside the top 100. We're almost there. <laughs> It's been quite the odyssey, um, but but we're looking forward to wrapping that up. But also, Chad and I hit WrestleMania 13 in a war zone recently. Uh, Ryan and crew will be having the Mania match previews leading up to this year's Mania, and we still have a lot more to go in this countdown. So here tonight, we're going to cover number 26, Mikey. It's the Hardy Boys. Um, we'll go through the resume in a minute, but just give me your first like gut reaction. When you think Hardy Boys, WrestleMania, what comes to mind? It's the, the one you know, both of us were at the most recent one uh, that they had 33, um, you know, not even the match itself, which is, you know, we'll touch on was really good, but the freak out when the new day was announcing who the next team was going to be and then finding out and then hearing that music that we just heard and just losing my mind and like, almost like just not like just being so freaked out that this was really happening. It's weird too. Cause it was, it was like rumored a little bit, but it was one of those things where you're like, eh, it's almost like too good to be true. And the rumors almost felt too unlikely to happen. And then the way New Day did it was masterful because they start to disrobe. You kind of think it's going to be them, right? It would make sense to be them. And then the Hardys music hit. I have a video on my phone. I was recording it just in case it was them. And I think it's the loudest, highest pitched scream I've ever let out was when they came out. Because I mean, I, even with all their personal troubles, and there's a lot of them. I mean, I've always just been a big Hardy fan. Um, I even have... Uh, can see here my avatar me and Jeff from GCW in Detroit last year. We got to meet him. He did a show, uh, did a one of the shows at GCW. I caught him coming around the ring. So that was a really cool moment to get to just grab a pick with him. 
Uh, just, just always been a big fan. I was a Matt Hardy V1 fan, big, big time in the early 2000s, like Matt Fax and all that. I was hard into that. So just always been a Hardy's guy. Were you, were you a Hardy's guy? I love them. Um, you know, growing up, like I started watching in 98. So they're there a year, you know, within a year, year or so into me being a fan. And um, I mean, they're like the tat, like them, Edge and Christian, the Dudleys, like those are the tag teams I associate with. So I always have like a really high bar of, what I view tag team wrestling to be. Um, yeah. Like you said, just great themes. I, I, it's just kind of cool. Like, especially Jeff, like the guy fumbles his words and can't, can barely get anything out when he cuts promos, but he's just so cool that people just want to be him. And I think that like his innate charisma is just awesome. Um, and Matt's, you know, Matt's great too. Yeah. And you can see that charisma just pop in that 08, 09 run. Like to your point, like just fans dying for him to win the big one. And they finally strap him up. Um, and it, he's just got an enigmatic career, which kind of fits who he is. It's like he finally makes it to the top and then leaves. <laughs> like, like it, it's just kind of crazy the way the whole path goes uh, with both of them. But they felt very homegrown. Like they did a job duty in the mid '90s, and then they kind of a job tag team in '98, and all of a sudden '99 they're saddled with Michael Hayes, and like, and all of a sudden just everything kind of clicks at once, and they they break out big time. So, um, all right, why don't we quickly run down their res- WrestleMania resume? Okay. Uh, so for, for this one, Ryan's been kind of aggregating some different star ratings across uh, various match reviewers. So we got Dave Meltzer's, we got John Canton, our buddy from the John Report, and then also our, our good friend Aaron George, my co-host on the Holes Bard, was drafted in for this one. So let's, let's just run it down real quick. So we got WrestleMania 16 is a triple threat ladder match. Uh, they lose to Edge and Christian, the Dudleys. Uh, average grade just under four and a half. Aaron went five on that. Uh, and at 17, we got TLC two, which is basically a rematch of the year before, just with the ladders and the chairs thrown in as well. Um, that's basically a five as well. Melissa was a little bit below, but can and Aaron, both a five 18 is where they start to slip. It kind of feels like it's the end of that, like classic tag division that you just mentioned. Um, they fight the APA, the Dudley boys and, and Billy and Chuck two and a quarter. Then Matt faces Ray Mysterio in the o- criminally short opener at WrestleMania 13, just a, a hair under three. Uh, Matt's and Money in the Bank in uh, 22 and 23. Um, so both those matches are great. Uh, 24, when he makes his big return, is an awesome moment from the injury. He t- attacks MVP. That's really cool. Um, and then 25, we get Matt versus Jeff in the Extreme Rules match. I like that match quite a bit. I, I think it was like a four last time I watched it. Um, th- th- these guys are a little bit lower, as you can see on the screen. 26, Matt's and the Money in the Bank again. And then at 33 is the ladder match we just talked about. Uh, versus Gallows and Anderson, the bar and Enzo and Cass. Uh, a couple other big moments. Um, 24, like I mentioned, Matt attacks MVP. 34, uh, Matt wins the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. And 35, they're on the Andre as well. Um, so I don't know. What, anything we talked about 33, so we know that's there. What else jumps out at you as far as that, that mania legacy? Definitely 17. It's, I think, my favorite. I don't know, like, my favorite one-on-one tag team because this is obviously a triple threat with these teams, but I just think it's perfect. Um, you have, like, Edge and Christian with their superpower, the chair, uh, the Hardys with the ladder, um, the Dudleys with the tables, and each, like, taking them and, like, using them, um, and just three teams that are so much better than everybody else. Um, I, I think it's, like, the perfect amount of run-ins with like yep. you know you have lita rhino and spike um running in for all of them not over the top not too much chicanery um and then you have the classic like if i have a, a if i had to pick something before wrestlemania 33 for a top moment it's probably jeff getting uh speared off the top of the ladder so i i don't know melts or whatever uh, but i agree with aaron's five star i mean it's perfect for me what about yeah, I think you? 17 is perfect. I could see being maybe a little lower on 16, but I think it's such a good story from year to year. So 16, like the Hardys and Dudleys had kind of broken out a bit. Uh, well, the Hardys really were consistent because they break out in the Terry Invitational. Then at the Rumble, they have a great match with the Dudleys and the tables. They do the Swanton off the balcony. Jeff does the Swanton off the cab in the balcony. So they, they were kind of rising. Edge and Christian felt like they were behind a little bit. And I think that felt like an upset at Mania when they win, but then they turn heel right off of that. Um, and they start to show their personalities. So all three teams at that point felt like mid-card at like a tag division. SummerSlam, 
by SummerSlam, they all feel like they're elevating up a level. They're, they're like semi-main. Like they all made event a lot on Raw during that summer. They have like the Rock teams with the Dudleys a bunch. Edge and Christian are teaming with Benoit. You know, like they're an angle. Yeah. You know, you get Team Eck and all that stuff. So it's like they really start to elevate and they have that awesome TLC match at SummerSlam. And then at WrestleMania 17, feels like they are full-fledged, like you said, like main event level guy. Like those, that feels like a main event level match. The tag division is elevated. And it's cool to see, watch that over the course of the year, how that all comes into play and how they rise to that occasion. Um, and as Christian win all three, which is, you know, which is kind of a nice touch. Yeah. But I'm with you. Like Spike and Rhino had just debuted off of ECW. Uh, so that felt like really fresh. Like these guys are out there. Like it felt something new and added to the feud. So yeah, I think you hit that. I think you hit it right in the head on that one. Um, I, yeah. I, and I guess something else uh, that like I wanted to touch on that you had mentioned Ray and Matt being so short, um, both were, you know, Ray had debuted within the last six months. He was super hot. Matt was really getting over um, the 2, 2.0 character, one version one. Um, and he, they were both really good. And it, I thought it was a really good match, but, you know, not even being six minutes. Uh, it's yeah. almost like a light version of Kurt and Ray from 2000, SummerSlam 2002, like not as yeah. good. Um, I don't know, like, I th- like they had they could have cut like one of the like, the the SmackDown tag match a couple of minutes because like I feel like they definitely deserve more, or even the the cat fight, the middle like half fight gets a bunch of time. Um, yeah, they didn't need much more, probably like three or four minutes. If they go more like nine to ten versus five, uh, it feels better. Matt was great in the build up too. He did all the stuff where he's trying to cut weight, right, to win the cruiserweight title. <laughs> um, so that, that's some really good skit work and stuff. So yeah, that that felt like a real tease and something that could have really elevated the resume. So it feels weird to say like that might be, you know, I don't call it a negative, but I think it hurts because that could have been even even better. So if you give them more time, and that hits what you know it can hit because Matt's a great base for smaller guys. I think he's actually underrated um, as a base for for the cruiserweights. So I think if you really let them tell the story and give them more of that 10 to 12 minutes, uh, I, I think that pops even higher. And I think that carries their legacy more. Uh, I think I think what hurts, too, is they don't have any modern stuff in the comeback, really. Uh, you know, because Jeff was still really over when he came back. He's got some fun stuff with Orton in the fall of 18. And it seems like whenever Mania came around, they're not really in, in the plans. Um, so I think I think something could have helped them if they were more involved on a on a bigger level at Mania in the later years when they when they feel like stars. Even um even 08 or or it's just like 06, 07 when they come back as a tag team, Jeff is fighting Umaga, they're fighting Caden mm-hmm. Murdoch. Like they're they're great in that tag division and that they're in the you know masses in the money of the bank at Mania. Like it feels yeah. like it feels like they could have had a hot tag match at Mania to kind of boost the legacy as well. Um, but how about the moments we mentioned? Do any of those extra moments like help carry them, or do you think there could have been more even in there? I think I think they're about fine. Like, I mean, I think they have all time moments where like we already talked about 17, which is enough, and 33. I think that's like two all time moments. Like, you know, things that are filmed on tel- like, you know, 33, one of the greatest comebacks of all time, Edge spearing. Yep. Jeff is still like an all-time thing that's shown. Um, I don't know. Like, is Matt superplexing Rick off the top of the ladder at 22? Is that like? I I don't think that's that's more of Rick than anything. Like anybody could have done that to Rick. Um, Maybe one of the crazy spots in 25. I think that 25 match is underrated personally. Like these guys are a little bit lower on it. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it the last time I watched it. Like I, when we did it for the place to be podcast, like over the last year or so, um, I think that's actually a match that, that gets kind of overlooked and even the feud, like I like the rematch of backlash a lot too. Yeah. Um, so I think that gets overlooked. So yeah, I went four stars at the mania match and I went three and a half at backlash. Uh, so I, I think that's one that's worth it. If, if, I, if we leave you with anything off of this, maybe rewatch that mania match because I think yeah. they do a nice job of doing what they couldn't do like a decade earlier, right? They tried to do the feud in 2001. They weren't really ready for that yet. And here it felt like a little bit more personal and they really kind of let loose. Um, so I think that helps. The 24, what did you think of that 24, Matt coming back and, and costing MVP? Because that's actually one of their best moments. I think it's also kind of overlooked. That is, that. that's a good call. Um, I was going to add 23, Jeff Swan tying on the edge to yep. knock them both out. Um, 
they were over. Like when you look at kind of the roster of the 24 ladder match, it doesn't look as good. Maybe yeah. in looking at it today, like a, you know, Monday morning quarterback, but um, MVP was super hot still. I mean, he didn't really tail off till later in 08. Yeah. Uh, they had a good tag team run. And again, that's a huge pop. Um, yeah. I don't maybe have it as high as, you know, the ones we talked about earlier, but uh, it's set up, you know, they had a really good feud in the fall as tag team partners, and it was pretty cool. It was a good way to, you know, it was a good addition to the match. Yeah, I think it's, uh, if it's your third or first, but third or fourth best moment, that's a really good one. <laughs> like, and that's yeah. where it's at, probably. So that's, that's good. It's like a good backup moment. Um, and even like, well, let's talk about it. like what could have added to the legacy, right? Like, I think one is both guys seem to always be in flux. At mania time, like, like it's yeah. Jeff is, you know, gets popped for drugs in 08, right? And he seems like he's going to win money in the bank. I think Punk ends up winning it. Mm. So, you know, that's one time where he he probably could have had another big moment. And then you talk about, and then we talked about the later years, like the kind of in and out. Uh, I feel like we don't really get like a great broken mat. I mean, it's not as good as TNA anyway, but even he wins the Andre, but it feels kind of too little too late. Um, and then even earlier, like WrestleMania 21, you know, Matt is on the outs, right? It's after they, he gets fired for the edge and lead of stuff for mouth and off on bite this. He comes back later in the year, hotter by mania. He's kind of, you know, he suplexes flair, but he feels kind of already kind of out of gas after the hot return. WrestleMania 20, I think he's, he's supposed to fight Mark Henry and that gets called off for whatever reason. So I, and it feels like these guys, like every year around mania time, something seems to happen and <laughs> they end up missing yeah. their missing it and then even 18 that to me really feels like the and end of that tag the hot tag division because like 17 feels like the peak and 18 feels like oh they're running back the hardies and dudleys again apa feels washed by that point so like and even that match is kind of whatever so um i think that if, if that if there's a better match at 18 and then i think if they if they hit on some of those hotter period periods and if jeff mm. doesn't get hit for the drugs in 08 if he wins money in the bank um, I, I think that really boosts them up into maybe the teens on this list. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I definitely agree. At 24 is like the big one that I've had in my mind. Like when we got this assignment to kind of go over, just Punk was fine, but he's still like after he won the title, he just became, he was just kind of whatever. But, you know, we're not, not talking about Punk in 08. But uh, that could have, you know, Jeff already had like a superstar 08 with all the suspension. So, um, I think that really would have helped. And just the mem- just like, I don't know, just him winning the briefcase, people would have flipped their shit, like, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I know you can't really control somebody leaving or getting fired, but uh, Jeff was still super over and before he left in 09. Um, oh, yeah. And he shows up in TNA, what, four months later? Yeah. Um, him somehow having a big match at 26 would have really helped if he just could stay a little bit longer. But um, yeah it just looks like i mean it's the the two huge tag matches and then really the only other like i mean then you're looking at 33 like you know a generation later uh it's it's pretty crazy that they don't have that because they have so many other memorable memories throughout non-wrestlemanias yeah i think the guys that seem to always do their best work like in the summer and fall (laughs) um, and then yeah whatever reason by mania time it's it's Fall apart. It, it would have been cool. Like they had that little thing with the Undertaker at the Rumble in 02. I mean, you don't want to take away Taker Flair, but if they could have done something with him at Mania, uh, mm-hmm. would have been cool. Or what if Brock debuts at Mania instead of the night after? Yeah. And, and you do Brock versus the Hardys or something like that. It could have been cool. Or Brock versus Jeff at Mania 18. That would have been super memorable. Um, yeah, there's definitely there's just little misses in there that could have really threaded things together. 09. I mean, if you could have found a way to cool him and punk off for a bit and then bring it back hot for Mania 26, uh, I think that could have been a good approach. Yeah. Mix things up as well. So, I mean, Punk Ray is good too. So it's, you know, again, it's tough to take these things off the board, but it's ways you could use them. So, Um, all right. So do you think 26 feels right? Or do you think it's could have been a better spot Uh, or should have been higher, should have been lower? Do you think this feels about right? Definitely. I don't think lower. Um, I wouldn't, not much higher because This basically all the things I said, like there's just too much. There's, there's a lot of highs, but then there's a lot of just like, okay, like that's fine. Um, I don't think I would keep them at 26 is fine. 
because even the money in the banks, you can't like you look at these ratings, it's like oh four, 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 but like they're not huge parts of those matches. Like you said, Jeff and Edge go out early in at 23. Um, 26, like it's kind of whatever. 22, yeah, Matt takes Flair off the ladder, but I don't think he's like a huge part of that match otherwise. Yeah. So you're really looking at the resume being 16, 17, and then the moment at 33. But yeah. those are real big like, those are great, like two five star matches in an all time moment. So I think it's enough to get them on the list. Like they're they're comfortably inside the top 40 that we're doing. And I think this feels about right. I, I think anything higher, you need at least one other match to really eclipse. It may have Jeff and, Jeff and Matt at 25 is more positively embraced by a yeah. lot of people. I know I have it higher, so maybe you could argue this should be up a little bit. If that like really clicked for everyone and they look at that more more fondly, you could say, okay, maybe, maybe 20, 22, somewhere in there. Yeah, um, I think if they're like viewed, Sean and Taker are going to be the best on that card, but if they're like yeah. viewed definitively like, that's the second match I think of, then I think it would yeah. be a lot better. Yep. I agree. And and it really it may like for folks should go back and watch it because I really think it, it may be the second best match on that show because the uh Orton Triple H definitely underperforms, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty easily. Um I'm looking at my grades right now. I, I have it as this third best after Money in the Bank. Okay. Um, and then uh Taker Sean. So for me, it's it's the third best match of the night. Uh as you get the steamboat Jericho stuff is really good. Uh, scene edge show is really good, but like there's not as much great on that show um, outside of those three. So, all right, Mike, anything you want to plug? Anything we should uh, check out with you here on, on North, South, North South Connection or a place to be? Uh, we have the fortune of being on these and uh, every other week, uh, depending on the schedule, I will be on the Cronoso Monthly. Awesome. So check those out for sure. Subscribe here on YouTube to our video content, audio on Podbean as well, and social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, doing a lot of short content lately, like I mentioned. So if you have any ideas or concepts you want to see, uh, you know, we've done some Mania tier lists. We can do more of those. Let us know. Just reach out in the comments. Be sure to share with a friend and get ready for more WrestleMania content, the North South Connection. Thanks for joining. Keep on uh, keep on hardying. I was going to say it doesn't really work, though. But we can uh, we can just do this instead, Mike. Right? We'll just... Uh, We'll go out strong with with our uh, theme song again. How about that? Okay.